Lupus is a story about a dude named Lane. He moved to the mainland and bought one place to stay. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. Hey everybody, Lane with the Simple Passive Cash Flow. To just remind you guys to help fight the negative one star reviews on iTunes, please leave a review for me and also share it with your friends because if you don't, soon you won't have any friends to have a mid-date lunch with when you're at home doing nothing or whatever you'd like to do at that point. Today, I've got Casey Stanton on the line. How's it going, Casey? Hey, good, Lane. So Casey is a former professor at marketing at Tulane University. He has since left that and has branched off on his own. Casey, why don't you fill us in on what you're doing and how you got there? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Back in 2008, I graduated from Michigan State University with a bachelor's degree in environmental policy. I thought the world was my oyster, and I quickly realized that I just got birthed into the workforce right at the housing crisis. I got to watch the unemployment rate go from about 5.5% and tick all the way past 10%, which means I had no chance of getting any real job. I spent my first summer at home living back with my parents. I remember putting my diploma on the refrigerator with a magnet and leaving the next morning to go mow lawns. And I spent that full summer mowing lawns, making low hourly rate, but I used that time really strategically. And I went to the library and I went online and I went on Audible and I just started listening to all sorts of different tapes and programs. I could get through in a work week, typically at least one of Tony Robbins' full programs. And that's really where I got started in this notion that I wanted to have my own business and I wanted to have the freedom and flexibility of being an entrepreneur. I wanted to take risk. The time on the back of the lawnmower gave me the opportunity to learn and to get prepared. And I had met a guy when I was mowing his lawn who had a product. I asked him how he built his business and everything. And he had a neat story to tell. And a few weeks later, I had saved enough cash to buy a small order from him. And then I went door to door and tried to sell his product. At the first door I knocked, I had a sale. The second door I knocked, no one was home. Then I decided to walk home because it was a good day. It was a good cash day. And being a millennial, I thought there had to be an easier way to make money. I still think it's pretty funny now, but I never went back to sell more. And I instead decided to say, how do I multiply my effectiveness of selling? And I figured out what that was, was marketing. Marketing is that notion of salesmanship multiplied. And I just fell into that world of marketing and It's just been a wild ride ever since. That's really how I got started was on the back of that lawnmower with those tapes and listening to the great stuff from Tony from the 90s. Just to preface this for the people listening, Casey is not a real estate investor. Casey has some interesting topics we're going to talk through that I think was applicable to the investor mindset. And we'll kind of bring it back into some useful things for investors and things to think about from somebody outside the real estate investing environment. Casey, why don't you tell us a little bit about you started listening to all these tapes and was there something in particular that triggered this for you? For us, it's a lot of people will read that Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. For sure. And Kiyosaki's wonderful. Just with my family and my experience with real estate, it was a great book, but it wasn't one that really hooked me. The one that hooked me was Tim Ferriss in his four-hour work week. So when I got a copy of 4-Hour Workweek, I got the audiobook, and I went through it multiple times, I think over the course of a month, and I decided that that's the lifestyle I wanted to try for. To be fair, I actually attained it. So that first summer working on the lawnmower, saved enough cash, and I started trying to sell this product that I was selling door-to-door online. And when I sold it, I got more confident with my abilities online. Long story short, I met a guy at dinner one day. And he gave me a call a few weeks later and asked me if I wanted to work together. And he put me on $1,000 a month to support him on driving ads. And that was my first four-hour work week. I was working for him about an hour and a half a week, closer to six hours a month. That paid for me to be able to head out to Europe. And I spent four months with a girl that I was dating. And we rode our bikes from Madrid all the way to Rome. By the time I left after four months, I had actually left with more money in my pocket than I had came to Europe with because I was working online. That's when the bug bit me and it showed me that all this was possible. Yeah, that four-hour work week, I read that and it's something that comes up, everybody talks about that book. And if you're listening right now and you haven't read that book, you got to read it. Yeah, Run, Don't Walk. If you've been saying you've been reading it, wanting to read it for about a few months now, like this in real estate investing is probably not for you. (laughs) I'll say that. You can't make something happen that's a priority that's going to change your life. Just quit now. Go watch some Netflix or something like that. Or... Yeah, absolutely. For me on that book, it was the lifestyle design. You can 
create your life how you want, just thinking outside of the box or away from the herd. What was your takeaway? Or... That's a great one. And being able to travel was wonderful. Spending time on the bike, being disconnected. And the guy that I was working for never knew I was in Europe until I was in Italy in a small town just outside of Rome where we were staying. And I had to steal internet from a, I think it was like a library. And I was sitting outside late at night because it was East Coast time that I was trying to look like I was working during. And, you know, mind you, I was delivering all the results that he was looking for. I really exceeded, I think, his expectations, but I did it on my own time. And he said to me at one point, he goes, Casey, that sounds like one of those European cars climbing up a hill. Where are you? And I was like, oh, actually, I'm in Italy. And that is one of those little European cars trying to climb up a hill. He asked me how long I'd been there, and I told him, and we laughed about it. The lifestyle design side of Four Hour Work Week was awesome. But one of the passages that I remember the most vivid was when Tim Ferriss said to his customer service people, go solve the problem, and I'm going to give you a level of authority to solve that. I forget what the amount was, but he said something like, if you can solve this problem for less than $50, I trust that you can solve it. And I thought that that was such a pivot on what most people do in business, which is micromanaging and like punitive force and those kind of things. And Tim Ferriss said, hire people that you trust, encourage them to make the right decision. And if they don't, you provide a level of psychological safety where they're allowed to fail within certain parameters and they're not going to get ostracized for taking these risks for the organization. I think what he was trying to do and to me, he, he started that off with giving them like a $50 leash and then $100 and $200. And then he trained them and he got it totally passive. I guess a good example is I tell my property managers, actually I don't even remember, but somewhere between $100 and $300, I'm like, dude, just get it done. Just do it. Don't even bother me. CC me on the email to let me know. Just get it done. I trust you. But like something came up today. I think one room needed to be painted. That room cost 700 bucks. I look through it, I verify that, you know, the hours and I think to myself, how long is it going to take to paint? But it's like $700 and I could waste an hour or two getting some bids or having them get some bids and maybe get it down to 500 or who knows. I might be paying two times the price, but I don't care. Time is worth more than that. Absolutely. And especially because a lot of your audience here has full-time jobs outside of the real estate world. When you start pegging your time and your free time and family time and all that, What's it really worth to you? I'll sacrifice a lot of money to have a date night. That's really important to me. So being able to have other people make those decisions, I think, is a really big deal. And I don't even have kids. I don't even have any excuse, and I still won't do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Casey, let's talk about this topic that you and I were talking about. What is that? Sure. This is an interesting word. The word is conation, and conation is, is a word that's not used much in modern lexicon, and maybe it's going to see a resurgence, but it's something that I'm particularly passionate about. And it's this notion that when you were born, you had a natural behavior of how you approached the world. There was a natural way to which you worked. What's important to know is the way that you were born, it's normal, however you behave. This is as far as like how you approach a task or how you approach work. And I see all the time people getting themselves into compromised positions where they're outside of their conation because they don't know it. They don't know who they are. They say yes to things that put them in a place of avoidance or stress, and they don't really know why. In the real estate market, and you're looking to go buy properties and do these different things, there's a few different approaches that you can take. One approach that you could take is to be highly analytical. I think being highly analytical is an incredible modality, but I'm going to tell you I'm not highly analytical. That's just not what I can do. Sometimes I daydream, what if I could be? Think about how much stronger I would be. Think about how much of a better marketer or entrepreneur I would be if I was that type of person. I'm not much of a researcher. Right? I don't like to have 150 tabs open inside of my web browser and be researching a bunch of different things. But my fiance does, and her natural conation or the way that she goes about doing work is different than mine. In knowing your conation, you can put yourself in a position where you can win more often. I think that's a really interesting topic to discuss. A lot of people that come to me, they're trying to help them get a single family home, and then they're doing all the research and like all the markets. And just like go to the same one that all of us are going to, the same eight or five markets that everyone else is doing and just spend your time on doing the due diligence, not this like high level market research. Sure. Yeah. To talk about this conation, the notion, when we think of modern psychology, there's really three pillars. You've got cognition, which is how smart you are, and that's an IQ test. And then you have affective, which is how you feel. What's the feeling towards something? What's your natural motivation? 
that is something that Strengths Finder can actually tell you. That's a book that you can pick up at Books a Million or wherever, and they have an assessment in the back. You can take it and figure out your strengths. For instance, one of my strengths is individualization. I like to work with individuals. I don't like working with big groups of people. I'm also a learner, which means I like to learn. I'm a maximizer. I like to get all I can out of all I've got. So these are my key strengths. So I know that. But then this missing piece is conation, which is your behavior or how you do work. When we lay out a task to do, which is go get a piece of property, purchase it, and create a passive cash flow from it, you first have to have the motivation to do it. And that's going to be the affective. And then the second piece is you're going to do it the way you do it, which is your conative. And then ultimately, you'll do it as smart as you can do it, which is your cognitive. If we look at the conative side, to me, that's the most interesting. One of the ways that you can measure conation is through an assessment called the Colby with a K, K-O-L-B-E, and it's colby.com. They have an assessment called the A assessment. And this is a paid assessment. It's about 50 bucks. It will tell you on a spectrum where you fall. And there's four key pillars, which are fact finder, follow through quick start and implementer. What you could say is, I talked to an entrepreneur yesterday who was long in the fact finder and long in the follow through. This guy's natural conation, his natural behavior was to do a lot of research and to follow an ordered task list. And this guy, if I lay out a process for him, I just step back and he runs that process like a well-oiled machine. He's always looking for more information to support it. He's a great researcher. He's an awesome guy. But his problem on the flip side, the dark side to his conation, is that he's a researcher with a long follow through, which means that he kind of has a hard time getting started. So if he can't get started, he's going to get caught in this notion of information overload. He's just going to be getting more and more information. and He can't figure out the right way to do things because there's too many different opportunities or ways to do it. And he's got to look and be really analytical about it. His weakness is actually my strength, which is I don't take a lot of time to look at all the details. I don't take a lot of time to follow an ordered set of tasks. What I do is I dive in. I'm a quick start. And that's the way that I measure on the Colby scale. I'm a quick start fact finder. I think it's really interesting to see that and how that plays out. If I put myself into a position where I had to follow an ordered list and I had to, let's say, research a lot, it's going to cause a lot of frustration to me. It's going to cause frustration to the people around me because I'm just going to be in a bad mood. And I'm not going to deliver well. But on the flip side, if I was out looking for property and I got a phone call from the realtor that said, go check out this one. And I drove over there and I could make the deal right then. And it was fast paced and exciting. That's me. That's really what I love doing. I think a big takeaway for Conation is try to understand or maybe even consider taking that assessment and see where you fall on the scale. If you fall on the analytical scale, understand that. And that's where you're going to want to be. And maybe the due diligence by looking at past government records or looking regularly at the paper at these different listings or online at different listings or getting into the details, maybe that's you. And that's great. If it's not you, if you're more like me, outsource it. It's easy to outsource a lot of that manual labor. It's not always the highest quality, but it's good enough for me. So I can go hire someone from, let's say, the Philippines to do a lot of research for me and spend just a few dollars an hour And that person buttresses my weaknesses and allows me to go farther instead of me focusing on my weaknesses and trying to improve them. But the the Philippines thing, just to rein you in there, that's not going to happen. And people need to do the research themselves for this stuff. Um, Sure. A a lot of things that came to my mind there is people come to me and they'll want to analyze a property. And yeah, they might be an analyzer and a lot of them are engineers. But I think most of the time it's just them being, as Arnold Schwarzenegger says, who also made his millions with real estate. He calls them girly men. I mean, they're just afraid of taking action. And, sure. And I, I, get the, yeah. I get the Kobe test, but I don't think people should be doing the Kobe test for those who always look for excuses not to take action on value-added activities. That's just my thought. Absolutely agree. And to speak to like hiring someone or outsourcing them for research, while maybe the due diligence for the property, it's important to do it yourself. On the flip side, if you needed a vendor to, let's say, mow the lawns, that's an easy task to outsource that I wouldn't want to do. You can still outsource those tasks. And sometimes you're right. You have to be outside of your conation, let's say, in order to get the work done. But generally speaking, you just want to put yourself there. I think this conation idea is a great idea. It's just people will use it as an excuse. Absolutely. It's so frustrating to see people try to use it as an excuse. For me, it's predictive. It's predictive of what's going to happen to the person outside of a sprint. When someone who's a quick start says, I'll follow this and do this every week, every Monday, and I'll get you that email, 
I'll expect it for maybe two weeks. Then on the third week, it'll come on Tuesday. And the next week, maybe it won't come and I'll have to remind them. That's just what I can expect. But there's no excuse for not taking action and supporting yourself and your family in the future. That's a lot of stepping up and doing hard work. I think being able to name the behavior helps you understand where there's going to be stress and maybe where you can get support. But you're absolutely right. If you're the kind of person that doesn't get out of bed hungry to grow and to improve your life or the life of your family, you might be better as an employee. Yeah. And real estate is not for everybody. But for those who want to jump in, look what it does. What I tell people a lot, and you mentioned it earlier, is don't worry about the how, but if your why is big enough, then you'll make it happen. Don't worry about, oh, how do I find a property? How do I do this? That's easy. I mean, that's what this podcast and the website and all these other podcasts are for. Right. That's one step at a time, right? Right. Yeah. You just got to get up and do the work. And that's an interesting one, how people prioritize the tasks in their life in order to get things done. And when you see on Instagram, the guy who's missing an arm, who is in incredible shape and he's a power lifter somehow this guy's a power lifter. He has no excuses. What are our excuses? And I really think seeing that stuff on a regular basis kind of puts into check if someone's fully abled and they're educated and they have a great job and they're trying to do this on the side, why not show up, overperform and do great things in your life? That's how I feel about this. I feel like you can excel at this if you just choose to. Right. Why not? A lot of people will say, well, I'll do it when I get money saved up. Well, right. those are the very people that should be doing this, getting their money doubled every five years. Yeah, absolutely. In, in all of these excuses, you're right. They just kind of buy us time. They don't necessarily get us closer. There's a strategy that came from my business coach, Dan Sullivan, and he talks about the four C's. And everyone wants confidence and everyone wants capability. We all want the confidence. We all want the capability. I want to be the guy who has 100 properties and I'm cash flowing five, six figures a month. That's who we all want to be. We want to be the confidence that we can do that. But in order to get confidence and have capability, we first must have courage and commitment. And I think courage is such a fun word because no one wants to be courageous. Everyone wants to be confident. But when you wake up in the morning and you're saying, doing this thing scares me, you're being courageous. And soon that courage is going to turn into like a skill that you have. It's going to turn into a capability that you'll own for the rest of your life. And I think that we don't encourage courage enough and it looks like action, but really it's a commitment to yourself that says, I'm going to do this. And even if I fail, I'm still going to do the work because I know that the effort is worth whatever the potential outcome is. But a lot of times what I see is people's ego getting in the way. They don't want to jump in and buy a rental property because then all their friends are going to laugh and make fun of them for, for failing. Really, the question is, are they your friends then? If these people aren't actively looking to like support you and to see you do better, Seth Godin says that we now live in a time where we can build our own tribe. I'm a nomad. Like I travel. I don't have a tribe based on proximity. I don't really keep in touch with college friends. I don't really keep in touch with high school friends. I keep in touch with the people who I've met along the way who encourage me and in exchange I encourage them. And as you grow this passive cash flow, which Lane you have, are you finding that the relationships that you have are better relationships? There are totally new people that I've been meeting. A lot of people contact me through the podcast and become friends. And on social media, I unfollow and mute a lot of people from high school and that I don't really have anything that you know in common with. You are the five people that you hang out with, and you're also right. the people that in your friend group, they could be the end of you. They can totally be a detriment to what you're trying to accomplish here. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of escape velocity needed. I was just out in Florida, and I got to see that Atlas V uh, take off from the Cape. It's using, what, seven of its boosters, eight of its boosters just to get out of the atmosphere. And once it's out of Earth's atmosphere, it only uses one booster to get up into orbit. So it uses eight times the energy in order just to get a couple hundred miles. And then at that point, it can go sailing with relatively low energy. If you look at that like your life, there's a lot of habit gravity. There's a lot of things holding you back. And it takes the steadfast commitment to yourself to really push through that. There's people that are pulling you back. There's people that say, I don't like who you're becoming. And they're going to come up with all of these different reasons why they don't like your success. You're putting yourself out there. It's too big of a risk for you. It's a risk for your family, yada, yada. With that risk comes the reward. And the reward is worth the risk. I don't think that there's really any reason not to do it outside of a lack of courage. Oftentimes, the, your biggest detractors like your family and your actually your parents who tell you oh they don't want to see you fail they just want you to live in a life of mediocrity and doing what you're doing for the next 30 40 50 years at your day job absolutely and 
in my situation, I was lucky and unlucky, kind of depends how you look at it, by not getting a job directly out of college. That forced me to really spend some time and be introspective. All of my friends were making, let's say out of college, I had a bunch of buddies in the engineering world who were probably clearing forty or $50,000 a year, which is huge money for a college grad who I had been working a $9 an hour job at the university. They were rolling in it. They were living large. And that time, I was renting a small apartment from my sister for 250 bucks in her basement inside of the cellar where part of my room was actually the furnace that would glow red at night. I went without some of those luxuries at the beginning, but now I have the experience and I have the capabilities to have a great lifestyle and a great income. So it does take some sacrifice. And people along the way told me, this is a bad idea, this is silly, yada, yada, whatever. Maybe I was just lucky to have tuned them out or maybe people just weren't that loud. But I kept my head down and did the work and the results can speak for themselves. That's not to say that people didn't actively try to pull me back. I think the coolest part about doing this podcast, I'm sure you can attest in a totally different industry, is that the people that you meet along the journey, people that you meet or may not be on your trajectory, but those who are, and you kind of keep in touch, and you guys climb the ladder together, and when you guys finally get there, it's pretty neat. It's pretty similar to your first job. You guys were the two newbies, and then you got a few years of experience, and you've been there for a while, and you guys are at the pinnacle of your career. It's kind of the same thing, but this is just way cooler than working at some day job kind of a thing. Absolutely. And where you meet again is always kind of fun. I remember that name. I remember that guy. He was a good guy. We had a beer like five, six years ago. And then I see him and he's got this great business. And it's like, oh, I like what you did, man. I've got a lot of respect for you. You're a great guy. And I'd love to have another beer. I liked your personality before, but I really like your hustle now. And I like what you've been able to create. I'm impressed with you. It's a cool place to be. Another thing I've noticed is I've heard the comment a few times where, hey, you're going to hang out with your real estate friends. People who don't do this kind of think that, hey, you guys are just doing it for money and that kind of stuff, which is a bad outlook on money. Money is more wealth creation, what kind of value you can create for others. But they think that we just talk about money. But I'm here to say that those are the people that are living in scarcity and they're having these conversations out of just scarcity mode. And the people that are doing this cash flow stuff, the conversations with those people, it's way more abundance mindset and how can we get back to others how can we think outside of the box and how can we live here and live here and have this kind of lifestyle for our family it's a totally different dialogue it's a totally different level of conversation and i'm not saying it's a better conversation but for me it's more exciting not being one of the big boys in investing quite yet aka the accredited investor in the eyes of the sec it's tough to find good options for investing. But then I started investing in the American Home Preservation or AHP fund, which is crowdfunding the mortgage crisis in America. The fund collaborates with existing homeowners to keep them in their homes. It's a way to make great returns while feeling good about making a social impact. After investing myself in the fund, it was awesome when they approached me to become an advertiser of the company. You can start investing with as little as 100 bucks, and if you want the free Burn Zone book, please send me an email to lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. In May of 2016, I left my job at Tulane University, where I was an adjunct professor of marketing, where I had my online jobs, the online businesses still running. But I left that post and said, all right, that was the only thing holding me to New Orleans. That was the only job. My fiance had gotten a job online. She works as a process manager. And we decided, let's get out of New Orleans. We were going to get out for the summer because it's way too hot. We were planning to see my family up in Michigan and just decided, you know what, let's sell it all. Let's downsize. And we got a Durango, figured out just how many Rubbermaid containers could fit in it, got a car seat for our dog, and we hit the road. And we're on a two-year trip right now. We're at about, I think, maybe eight months into the trip right now. And our goal is, at the end of the two years, to have tested all of the cities that we're interested in and move into the one that we want. So we did Michigan for the summer, and then we did Toronto. Now we're seeing family. We get to bounce around. We're going to go do Orlando for a bit, Nashville, and then go settle in Austin for a few months. Once it gets a little too hot, we'll head back up north, go check out Chicago and Pittsburgh and a few other cities. And then maybe next year we'll run west and go check out Seattle and some of those. It's fluid. It's open. We have the opportunity to go places where our friends are. We can go to different events as it makes sense. And we don't have anything tying us down. It's just a ton of fun to be able to do that, to have that freedom. Someone that maybe 40, 50 years old has a kid and they're like, well, we can't really up and leave them. What are your thoughts there? What are their options? 
I've got a friend who runs a successful business out of Chicago. This guy takes his kids out. I think he's in Bali right now. And he does, I think, six or eight weeks in Bali every year. He said that the best education he can give to his kids is through travel, understand different cultures. It's not all homeschool, but when they're traveling, they create a curriculum for the kids and have the kids stick to it. They're not experts at creating curriculum, so they hired that out. They know what they need to do, and they encourage their kids to do it. I think they're fostering a really like fantastic relationship with their kids, and their kids are seeing the world. My friends are like able to do what they want. It's really a wonderful experience. I don't think you have to be tied in unless you want to be. And there's nothing wrong with being a homebody, being someone that wants to stay in the town that they're in. It's about having the opportunity to make that decision yourself. I don't think it's impossible for families to travel. I know a few that do, and they do it really successfully. If I had one caution, it would be stay in one place long enough. We stayed in Toronto for two months, and that was almost too short. Maybe three months would have been better. That's why in Austin, we're going to go stick there for three months. Three months at a time, you can get an Airbnb. It's cheap. You can get it fully furnished, sell all the stuff that you have. You really have no other costs. It's really an incredible way to go. So I'm going to try and push you even further along, and people will say, oh, we got family here. We got the dog. What's another option? We can't go to Austin for three, four months at a time. We're pretty terrible at homeschooling our kids. What's something that the layman can do out there? It's a great question. What do you do in your free time? What are your hobbies? What are the things that you enjoy? Can you take time off and do those? What is passive cash flow for? We're also looking at a really interesting time, which is with automation. How many jobs will automation take over the next 10 years, over the next 20 years? How many truck drivers are going to be out of a job because it costs only $30,000 to retrofit a Peterbilt with a self-driving module? We're going to lose a lot of these jobs that make up a lot of the American workforce. These people are going to lose their jobs. This is going to happen. What are people going to do then? I think it's a really interesting question. And I think that parlays into what's going to happen when you have passive cash flow. You don't have to work as much. Either your job's taken from you in the case of automation, or you choose to bring in this passive cash flow. What are you going to do? I think that creative pursuits are going to rise. I think experiential creative pursuits are going to be big. Go get creative, find your hobby, and go be great at it. Spend time, go be a painter, go be a photographer, go be a potter, whatever it is. Maybe you love coaching Little League. It's doing that kind of stuff. You don't have to leave to really enjoy the benefits of this stuff. But I'm going to tell you that we're going to see a resurgence of play, I think, at large. And I think entrepreneurs, especially those with the free time or the passive cash flow, are going to be the first movers on it. So go do it. Go do something radical. Go have fun. That's ultimately what this is about. I don't work online so that I can travel the world as much as I work online so I can do what I want. So what do you want to do? Ultimately, you want to try and find something that's your passion or also contributes back to others. And to try and be a thought leader in something, try and ask yourself, what's your pain point? What's your biggest painful thing that you've gotten? That's one thing that inspires that thought that what you're going to do if you had all this money and then you didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing more boring than a wealthy person that just has money. You know what I mean? Like the whole old wealth world. I mean, how boring is it to meet someone with old money? It's That's like, what most people think about when they think of a rich person, right? Yeah. I want to see a young person. It doesn't matter how old you are, but someone who has made it for themselves and they are themselves. I want the person to be quirky. I want them to have fun. I want them to be different. I want them to be unique. If we get to play and no one is saying you have to show up at eight o'clock and you have to check out at five o'clock and your lunch break is 30 minutes. You only get two weeks of vacation, but you have to schedule it in times where you probably don't want to take vacation. If we're not living in that binary world anymore, where we have to show up to work like that, we have to go play. We have to go explore. We have to have fun. And I think a failure to do that is just living kind of a meager life. And you can still have that level of play even without the passive cash flow. It's just the buying power that you would have with passive cash flow allows you to do more, have more fun, maybe hire other people to do the stuff you don't like. Unfortunately, a lot of people have been in it so long that I personally don't like to pop paradigms. Sure. And I hear you on that. But it's happening for the millennials. That's for sure. You know, this notion of autonomy for millennials, being able to work from anywhere or the notion of you could hire someone to get work completed, not for time. 
I want to pay someone for results, not for the effort. I don't care if your workday starts at noon and it ends at eight o'clock at night. I don't care, right? As long as you do the work, we're definitely moving in that world. And that frees people up, I think, to be themselves more. And, and I think it's like a self-exploration. I really think that's the opportunity that us entrepreneurs have. Any other interesting ideas that would benefit the passive investor? To me, one of the biggest breakthroughs that I had was a story from a student that I had at Tulane. The student was in class and he was like the quintessential bad kid. Wore a leather coat, had half his head shaved, just kind of looked like a bad kid. He was a really nice guy. But I was talking to him in class and I asked the class at large, you know, who has a job? And he said he did. And I said, well, where's your job, Juan? And he said, I work at a sunglasses hut. Well, how is it? And he goes, dude, I kill it. I crush it. I'm the best salesman. And I was like, well, how do you know that? He says, listen, we do a sales report every Friday and I'm always at least two, sometimes three times more sales than everyone else. I was like, that's awesome, man. He's like, yeah, I am a born salesman. It sounds like a great job. And then he challenged it and said, actually, it kind of sucks because I'm kind of forgetful and I work two jobs. So sometimes I go to the wrong job because I don't have my schedule in order. Sometimes I show up and I don't have the keys and I have to go home and get them and I'm late opening the stores. I've lost the keys once. He's like, so all of those things, it really sucks and it gives me a lot of stress. So I brought this conversation up in a business meeting I was in and a guy said to me, I would fire his ass and I would kick him out because he is demoralizing the team. He's dragging everyone down because he's late, because he's not opening on time, because he's a jerk. And then someone else interrupted him and said, that's an interesting way to do it and maybe how our parents would have done it. But what would it cost us to hire someone to pick him up with the keys in their hand and go unlock the door for him? Maybe call him the night before and remind him that work was the next day. What would that actually cost in the grand scheme of things? Maybe 30 bucks, but he's going to sell double, maybe triple the amount of sunglasses as someone else. We identified a talented person who was being stopped or is being slowed down in his own talent because he was asked to do something that was really hard for him. And the solution as a business owner was just to hire out something small. I wonder how that could play into the life of a real estate investor. If there's something that you're doing that's frustrating and difficult and it's really just hard, it might just be easier for you to do more of the stuff you're great at and find someone else to do the stuff that you're weak at. And that's a notion that I call a functional team, having people around you that support you, understanding their motivations and their clination. I think that's the biggest thing and seeing how that story plays in because it's easy to fire that person or to get frustrated at yourself. Yeah, I can wish I can do better. But you know what? Time after time, Juan's going to struggle with that. He could get better and he owes it to himself to work hard to get better, put systems in place to ensure that he doesn't forget the keys and he knows when to go to work. That's a little inexcusable. But also as a business owner, we have the opportunity to leverage people's talents, including our own, and buttress them with other people's. And I think that's a huge takeaway. Like a teacher who, that's their skill and that's their passion. That's how they get enrichment is teaching kids. But at the end of the day, they're screwing around grading these papers and doing this busy work, which is totally draining. <laughs> it's just like me on this totally podcast, draining. right? I like the podcast, but it sucks to edit and it takes forever. And it takes like a huge chunk of my time yeah, and I'm trying to pay someone to edit it. And, you know, I've been going on the Filipino Craigslist and he's getting VAs there. I mean, but you had to do it yourself first. You had to get it so that you understood how to hire someone else into it. But as you scale and this gets bigger and, you know, the revenue increases, it's an easy line item just to outsource and it'll free you up and it'll make sure that the work that you're doing is more joyful. I think that's a big deal. You get so much joint energy from doing the things that you're good at and so much pain and you get tired from doing the things that you aren't. I think the, the whole VA premise is it just illustrates the idea that time is your more important resource here. Absolutely. Speaking of grading papers as a teacher, I hated it. That was one of the first tasks that I did was I outsourced the grading of the student's papers to a VA. She would work at night, which was her daytime. I would just take a photo with my iPhone, upload everything up to Trello. In the morning, she would have all of the grades in a Google Doc for me. And then she would also submit them to the university. So I was able to outsource the worst part of the work for me at a cost of maybe, I think, $5 an hour. And that was a great rate for her. You know, I overpaid her based on what she had asked for. Just so, curious, did you have to keep that under wraps? I never said it out loud. You know, I was in a great position where I'm not an academic, my experience is directly from doing the work. 
And that's where I provide the biggest value to those students with saying, here's what's happening in the real world. Here's how to understand yourself. Here's how to understand the marketplace. And here's how to drive great marketing campaigns. The university knew that I wasn't. I don't have a master's degree. They gave me a little bit of room there. I don't know if they know. I don't know if they'd be upset if they knew, but maybe they'll listen to this someday. I think it's interesting, like in an industrial revolution or even when the baby boomers are around, everybody was saying you need to be good at one thing. You need to be a unitasker. And then somewhere between when I was born and now it's you need to be the jack of all trades. You need to do it all. Definitely sounds like the futuristic thing is that we're going back to doing what you're doing best and your highest and best use. Oh, for sure. There's a great book. This gets a little into the futurist side of things, but it's a book by Salim Ishmael called Exponential Organizations. And his notion is, what's an exponential organization? Well, it's an organization that uses a few of the 10 traits that he describes. One of the traits is autonomy. Another trait is work on demand. So being able to pull people in. Uber is a great exponential organization because Uber doesn't have cars. They have a dashboard and they have an application. They hire contractors and pay the contractors based on the work. They don't retain them or anything. That's an exponential organization. They can increase 10x and probably only hire a handful of people to make their business grow 10x. As we see that happening, as other businesses kind of clue into this notion of an exponential organization, and I encourage the listeners here to go look up Salim, I-S-M-A-I-L, Ishmael, on YouTube and look at his TEDx or his TED Talk. I think it was Ted Proper. It's awesome. And it'll give you an idea of where business is going. So as you get really good in the real estate side, and let's say you get a couple of these properties giving you passive cash flow, and you're hitting that minimum of what you needed to make, start getting a little strategic and saying, okay, I'm really good at this. Maybe my spouse is really good at this, but we both are really bad at this thing. Let's go see if we can find someone to do that. You go bring that person in. Now you've got a functional team that supports you and that team's moving further. You're doing more of the work that you love. You're getting better results. Everything grows because of that. Great discussion today, Casey. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, the mantra of the podcast is simple passive cash flow. It's simple getting the passive cash flow. It's what you do after. That's the hard part, trying to figure everything else with all your free time and all this passive cash flow. Like, What are you going to really do at that point? It's so exciting. Like, We're in this renaissance of creativity we're going to get displaced by robots. That's going to happen at large. And I know it sounds silly, but we're seeing self-driving cars already. We're seeing drones that are flying packages. We're seeing algorithms that are trading stocks. We're seeing financial advisors getting displaced by algorithms. We're seeing all sorts of labor being replaced by robots. The McDonald's workers who went on strike demanding a certain wage and in exchange, McDonald's put automated kiosks together. It's really a troubling time for a lot of people. And As a entrepreneur who's taking risks now, your reward is to figure out what you're going to do. Because like it or not, take action today and get passive cash flow or don't. But in 10 or 15 or 20 years, your job probably won't exist. You're probably going to be fighting potentially more skilled people than yourselves to find work. And you're going to find that they can reduce the cost because there's a lot of demand with a short supply of jobs you're going to be in this position anyway. I think it's really exciting to have the opportunity to figure out how to be creative and live a life that's exciting and to get meaning. This notion at large that we have these mediating bodies that give us meaning. I've got buddies from college who are still Spartans. You know, that's a big deal to them. They might have a tattoo or they're like real big sports fans. That's great. That's their mediating body. That helps give them meaning. They get together on Sundays to watch football. And that's a big deal for them. To me, it just wasn't not saying that they're bad or good or whatever. That's just their mediating body. Other people like my father graduated college and signed up with IBM and ran that for 26 years. And IBM gave him meaning. They said, do this and this, and you'll ascend up to this role and you'll get this much and you'll get the corner office. They gave him meaning. Well, what we're doing is we're taking this game. We're taking this life that we have and We have a blank slate. We can create whatever we want. I think it's exciting, but it's also scary. Everyone wants confidence. They want capabilities, but no one has the courage to go back to Dan Sullivan's four C's. You have to figure this out. Either you figure it out now or it hits you over the side of the head in a few years and you're in a really bad position. Courage to think that, Lane, you're talking to these entrepreneurs now, that they're going to take action, that they're going to get the cash flow, that they're going to support themselves because their 401ks might disappear. 
those things might happen. The stock market, what's going to happen to it? I don't know. But I do know that entrepreneurs are the people that fuel the economy. If you're taking action and doing that now, I think there's no better investment in your life than your own health and in your own financial health. Casey, well, if people want to get a hold of you who is climbing the ladder and want to climb the ladder with you, how do they get a hold of you? We've got two things. We've got a tech and marketing company that does implementation. And this is maybe a fit for those who have invested in a number of different properties and they've reached a ceiling of complexity where the technology to manage things is just too much. In that situation, we're a great team. We're a marketing and technology implementation company. We've got direct response designers and programmers and marketers and project managers. We've worked with a ton of big names from Peter Diamandis's New York Times bestselling books. We helped launch and we helped him raise one and a half million dollars on a Kickstarter in 35 days. Our team has been behind seven-figure product launches online with some notable gurus. We've built technology platforms for all sorts of different people. We are a great team to solve problems that are complex and difficult. That's tech guys who get marketing. We actually named ourselves the benefit that, which is tech guys who get marketing. If you're interested in learning more about the tech guys business, or if you have a complex need that needs a custom solution, or you want to get clarity and strategy around launching something big to an audience, maybe this is while you're producing the cash flow to your real estate, you want to have your opus do something else. That's a great use for tech guys. So you can go to techguys.co. That's www.techguys.co. We'll have webinars coming up, which will be educational webinars. Our typical audience is the Inc. 5000 crowd. But I love and I'm really passionate about this notion of functional teams, building teams that are strong and work well together and help grow businesses. That's one of the things that I'll be lecturing on in upcoming webinars there. So people can go there and sign up and learn more about what we do. All right, Casey. Well, thanks for joining us. Different podcast here, but I think it all pertains to real estate investing because this stuff is pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just to close, the biggest thing for me, it's courage. I think we identified that have courage, know that you're being courageous, know that courage is not much different than fear, right? Courage is doing the thing, but you can still be afraid of it while you're doing it. Taking action, taking risks. It's the people that take the risks that get the reward. I think that's a huge deal. And I encourage people to remind themselves that yes, I'm being courageous right now. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but the reward's going to be worth it. You know it, Lane. I know it. A number of the entrepreneurs that are listening to this have been through this courage process and they've come out the other side with wealth to show for it, failure to show for it, a great time, a funny story, something. And it's always worth it. Thanks, Casey. I appreciate right. it, man. Appreciate it. Take care. So long. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.